brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the things that I really love about the narrative lectionary is uh, that before we get to Christmas anyway, is that we cover the sweep of the entire Old Testament, kind of like skipping stones, uh, flying through the air week to week, and just touching down every Sunday uh, to hear the foundational stories of our faith. The stories of such giant figures as Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and today Moses. The downside of this, however, is that we move forward by great leaps and great bounds. And today, for instance, we have found the people of God enslaved in Egypt without any idea of how they got there. So before we dive into the story of God's people in Egypt and how God is present with them, let's take a step back and see how they got there. Jacob, the same sneaky, cheating brother from last week, uh, decides that having brothers is a great idea, and so he himself has 12 sons. Uh, Jacob, like his father Isaac, uh, has a favorite. Jacob's favorite is a son named Joseph. And so, Jacob, to demonstrate how much of his favorite Joseph really is, gives him a spiffy coat. Joseph then brags about his spiffy coat. The other 11 brothers aren't so terribly thrilled with this whole coat situation. They beat Joseph up, throw him in a pit, and eventually sell him into slavery in, you guessed it, Egypt. Now, Joseph's Egyptian misadventures, uh, we read them last year, and they're found between chapters 39 and 46 of Genesis. That's a little too much to recap now, but if you're ever in the mood for melodrama, go check it out. Uh, the short version is this. Uh, Joseph eventually rises up from slavery and imprisonment and becomes a trusted advisor in the Pharaoh's court. He leads all the people of Egypt through a famine, as Gary told us, by successfully storing up grain during years of plenty. Then Joseph's brothers come to Egypt, trying to survive the famine themselves, and uh, the family is reunited and winds up occupying a privileged place in Egyptian society. Again, not without one or two melodramatic twists and turns along the way. That is, uh, until a pharaoh who did not know Joseph came to power. He enslaves the whole Israelite people on the spot, and God finds them there today, groaning under the weight of oppression. And the rest of our story then today is the story of how God is present with them. After the account of God's people groaning in slavery, our reading itself skips ahead a little like a stone, and we come to one of those foundational stories, as I said, one of the stories of Moses. Now as we read this story today, uh, Moses is speaking to God in the wilderness, and God's voice is coming to Moses out of a bush that is burning up with fire, but not consumed by it. Now the reason that Moses is out there talking to God in a burning bush in the wilderness at all is because he has fled away from Egypt. He was raised in the Pharaoh's court, uh, saved from a culling of Israelite children as a baby and uh, raised in the Pharaoh's court of all places. Uh, but then, uh, as he grew older, he killed an Egyptian uh, overseer for beating an Israelite slave. Uh, and that caused him to rush out to the wilderness where he's met God today. And now, God is asking Moses to go back to Egypt and proclaim the freedom of God's people. To tell Pharaoh, let my people go. But Moses protests over and over and over again. Now I want to emphasize, Moses is not just displaying what we might call Northern European humility when he protests against God here. He's not just saying, oh no, don't send me, but really wanting God to all the time. 
Moses is right when he says these things. He really is a bumbling, tongue-tied dude. And he's unlikely to be accepted when he goes back to Egypt. He's unlikely to be accepted by the people of God. He grew up in Pharaoh's court, after all. And what will he say to them when they ask who sent him? He's unlikely to be accepted as a voice for the Israelites by uh, the Pharaoh. He did just kill an Egyptian. And so Moses' objections are real, but one by one, God overcomes these objections. So determined is God to come to the aid of his people. And when Moses objects and says that he cannot speak well, God says to him, who gives speech to mortals? Is it not I, the Lord? God emphasizes that this does not depend on Moses. God is and will continue to be in control of the situation back in Egypt. But Moses still protests. And while God becomes angry with Moses for doing so, in the end, God provides what Moses needs. God ensures that Moses will have someone to speak for him in the person of his brother Aaron. In the end, God promises to be with Moses, to be present with him, as he undertakes the work that God has put before him. When Moses objects and says, What will I tell the people when I say that the God of your ancestors has sent me to you? And they ask, What is his name? What, what do I say then? Then God answers Moses by saying, I am who I am. Well, that's not exactly what God said to Moses. It's impossible to translate the Hebrew word for God's name into English. In fact, we don't even really know what the word itself was. We only know some of the letters. But what we do know is that when God gives his name to Moses, that name comes from the verb which means to be. Essentially, God tells Moses that God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, of Jacob, and all his descendants, that God is the one who is. Full stop. The one who exists. God is the one who is present. And through Moses, with the help of Aaron, God will be present to the people of God in bondage to Egypt. And that's the point of our story today. This is what God is up to, being present with God's people, with you, with all of us, and all the world. Just as God used Moses and Aaron to bring his presence to the people of God down in Egypt, God uses each of us to bring the presence of God to God's people throughout the world. Now, when we find God's people in bondage, it isn't always as easy as Moses going down to Egypt and finding God's people in bondage to slavery. When we find God's people in bondage today, we find God's people, we find ourselves in bondage to so many different things. In bondage to poverty and injustice. In bondage to success and to money. In bondage to sin and in bondage to death. And when we are sent to God's people, we, like Moses, might feel staggeringly ill-equipped. And when we do, God gives to us what God gave to Moses. God gives His presence to us. God is present with us in the Word, our family story of faith. God is present to us in the bread and wine we share, the body and blood of Christ our Lord. 
God is present to us in the baptismal waters that once washed over us, giving us birth into the family of God. And God is present to us in each and every one of our brothers and sisters in faith. After all, it is they like us who are the ones that God sends to God's people in bondage. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.